Hi, I'm Jacqueline Eckern, the founder and president of Eating Disorder Hope, and we are very excited to have you with us for our inaugural online conference today. Very excited to introduce our next presenter, who is a, a dear friend of mine and someone I admire significantly. Um, her name is Jessica Setnick. She has her master's degree, she's a nutritionist, and she's just kind of an overall expert in the field of eating disorders. Um, Jessica is also the owner of Congruence Consulting and EatingDisorderJobs.com. She's a certified eating disorder dietitian and a supervisor for others that hold that designation. She is also the author of the Eating Disorder, excuse me, Eating Disorder Clinical Pocket Guide and Eating Disorders Bootcamp. She is co-founder of IFED, which is a pretty interesting organization you'll want to check out called the International Federation of Eating Disorder Dietitians. And one last thing I wanted to add is that Jessica has generously offered to donate a copy of her book to one lucky attendee of this presentation. So be sure and enter, <clears throat> excuse me, your name and address and email in the chat section. I will get that and enter you in the drawing and we will send that out to one lucky winner. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Miss Jessica Sutton. Great. Thank you, Jacqueline. Thanks for including me in this event. I'm excited to present because we have a huge problem in the eating disorder treatment field, and that is so vital that we change the way that we are describing dysfunctional eating behaviors. I have a real sense of loss that the research that we're doing is so separated from the actual human experience of eating disorders, and it all stems from the diagnostic criteria. So my goal today is to present a different way of looking at things, which is actually the way that many, if not most, clinicians in clinical practice actually look at eating disorders, but because of the DSM being the basis for all research, any research done on eating disorders is only based on the diagnostic criteria, and so we have a problem. Um, I'll describe the problem this way. Everything that we do when we talk about an eating disorder diagnosis, anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, binge eating disorder, avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, um, night eating syndrome, any other eating disorder, what we're doing when we use those words is we're describing symptoms right? We're describing the symptoms of not eating enough to sustain life, or we're describing the symptoms of eating and then feeling the need to get rid of the food. So what we're doing when we describe eating disorders with those names is we're describing the symptoms that someone's experiencing, not the actual disease. Of course, the problem is that we don't know what the disease is. We don't know if bulimia is actually a hormonal disease or a brain chemistry disease or a brain, a brain morphology disease, or a genetic disease. We don't have the information about what these diseases are, so we describe them based on their symptoms. The problem with that is that we probably have more than one disease that causes, let's use the example of bulimia nervosa, and yet when we research bulimia, we are putting people in groups based on their symptoms, which may be adding people with different diseases into the same research protocol. So for example, I'll, we'll just give do a totally made up study, 100 people, let's pick women, because for a long time all of our eating disorder research was on women, even though men have eating disorders at almost the same rate, and then that doesn't even include individuals who are gender non-conforming, right? So, that's just a whole other issue that I won't address, but I'll just mention. So let's say we have 100 women who all meet the criteria for a diagnosis of bulimia nervosa. They're all eating large quantities of food in a discrete period of time, right? We're just going based on the diagnostic criteria. They're all using an appropriate compensatory measure after eating to get rid of the food. They have body image distortion it's been going on for a certain period of time. This is the diagnosis of bulimia nervosa. So 100 women with bulimia nervosa are all administered Prozac, let's say, in an effort to see if it improves their symptoms. Well, maybe we find out that 50 
people get better and 50 people have no change or get worse. Well, the results of our study are now going to be published saying that bulimia, I'm sorry, that Prozac have a 50% effective rate in treating bulimia nervosa. But maybe bulimia that's caused by depression has a 100% effectiveness rate with Prozac because Prozac is an antidepressant, right? And maybe the 50, maybe 50 of the people with bulimia have bulimia because of a terrible traumatic event that happened in their life that triggered their bulimia, and they're not going to get any relief from Prozac because they don't have depression, let's just say. So you can see from my example that, that just sort of a, you know, a very not reality-based example, but yet the, the idea behind it is that we are grouping people into categories based on their diagnosis that aren't necessarily suffering from the same disease. Um, it's like saying three people are coughing, we give them all a cough drop, one gets better, one stays the same, and one dies. Well, why? We gave them all the same treatment, right? Essentially, we give everyone with an eating disorder the same treatment. We give them nutritional counseling, psychoactive medication, individual counseling, possibly group therapy, possibly nutritional restoration, um, depending on their needs. Well, we give everyone the same treatment, but not everyone gets better. So how do you explain that? Well, one person had a sore throat, and so a cough drop solved the problem. One person had tuberculosis, so a cough drop does nothing for them. And one person was already choking on a cough drop, so giving them another cough drop was the end for them. That's what I'm talking about, that if we are just looking at the outward symptoms of someone's eating disorder and treating that, we are not treating the underlying cause of the disease and it's very challenging to treat the underlying cause if we don't actually know what it is. So the solution is a middle ground, where instead of just looking at someone's diagnosis, we look at a sort of a comprehensive picture of their dysfunctional eating behavior. And I'll say behavior, because usually someone does not only participate in one dysfunctional eating behavior. And I just realized I wrote that higher up than my computer camera can catch. So let me see if I can tilt it a little bit for you. Voila, there we go. Dysfunctional eating behaviors is a different way of looking at eating disorders rather than eating disorders, the diagnosis. Dysfunctional eating behaviors are really on a continuum. The same person who is diagnosed with anorexia might have binging and purging behaviors, or just purging, or just binging, right? We know that to be true. So why do we put them in a box labeled anorexia nervosa? Just because they're underweight? Someone with binge eating disorder might also have periods of restriction, right? So why do we not label them with anorexia? It doesn't make a lot of sense if you think about trying to pigeonhole someone into one individual behavior. We've all had patients who have restricted, binge, purged, cut, over-exercise, maybe even all in the same day. So it's, it doesn't make sense to put people in boxes based on which behavior they're doing. Now they may need treatment for each individual behavior, but this new model is not specific about which dysfunctional eating behavior someone is participating in now or this month or this week. The idea that we all have dysfunctional eating behaviors as human beings, meaning we all sometimes do things with food that are for a purpose other than fueling, right? But the significance is more, are your dysfunctional eating behaviors neutral in your life? Are they damaging in your life? Are they destructive to your life? Or are they threatening your life? That's the continuum that we're seeing in our offices and our treatment centers, right? We People who have a positive relationship with food, usually we aren't seeing in our, in our treatment, but it's people who are on that continuum of negative eating behaviors, dysfunctional eating behaviors. So this model focuses not on which behavior someone has, but it focuses on the origin of the dysfunctional eating behavior. And that's where, as I said before, most clinicians are actually doing this work, are actually assessing what's behind someone's dysfunctional eating behaviors, but our research doesn't support that, and we don't have treatment protocols based on the origins of dysfunctional eating behavior. We only have treatment protocols based on if someone is doing this behavior with their food, they need this treatment. But really we are 
confounding our research when we do that because we're putting people with different diseases in the same research population. So, okay, here we go. The origins of this functional eating behaviors model takes into account that there are many, many, many different paths to dysfunctional eating behavior, and probably as many different paths as there are human beings, right? Because no two humans have the exact same experience, the exact same brain chemistry, the exact same genes, the exact same microbiome, right? Everyone's different, so if there's seven billion people on Earth, there could be seven billion paths to dysfunctional eating behavior. But they seem to cluster into about four groups. There are a lot of subgroups, but I'm going to put them into four main groups right now, and then when you ask questions, you can ask me more um, about which group may have more than one subgroup, which probably all of them do. But for ease of this session, we'll go with four. Four groups, four types of dysfunctional eating behavior. So first of all, I'm going to list biology-based. Biology-based dysfunctional eating behaviors. And I'm specifically not saying genetic because gen genetics means different things to different people, right? So I'm an anthropologist by training, and so linguistics is part of anthropology, and the way we use words is very significant to me. So when we say genetics, I think we tend to think of something that's inherited, it's in your DNA. And we do know there's a DNA-related component of anorexia nervosa. That's the only one that's been identified so far. By uh, maybe not coincidence, it happens to be related to the gene that codes for celiac disease. So we've got um, an autoimmune component, too, that is probably a biology-based aspect. I'll just write celiac disease, for example. Those um, are biological predispositions or biological connections with eating disorders or dysfunctional eating behaviors. Now, there are two types of dysfunctional eating behaviors that I can think of that are 100% biological. Biological not just being genetic, but one example is a completely genetic dysfunctional eating behavior, and that is called prayer willy Crater willy is a genetic disease. It's something in someone's genes. It's a mutation, so it's not inherited. It's something that shows up around two years of age when a child will start to have an insatiable hunger and will eat basically almost anything, anytime. So this is a child who is eating off other people's plates, possibly eating out of the trash can, hungry all through the day, hungry all through the night. It's a very serious illness or condition and it is untreatable, basically. Um, recently, treatments have started to look at genetics um, and trying to change the DNA. It's not done yet. It's not completed. Nothing has been shown to work yet. So all that can be done up till now is behavioral training to help teach a child that this is a feeling that you are going to feel and you can't eat every time you feel hungry. That is a path to more illness. Um, but Prater Willie would look a lot like binge eating disorder, but it's not. It's not a behavioral condition, it needs behavioral treatment, but it is a totally genetic, totally biology based dysfunctional eating behavior. Another example is PANDAS or PAN. PANDAS stands for Pediatric Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Disorders Associated with Streptococcal Infection. Whew. That is when a child will have a strep infection. Maybe they go to the doctor, maybe they don't. Maybe it's not bad enough to even get treated. And then six weeks or six months later, they wake up with full-blown symptoms of either anorexia nervosa, a generalized anxiety disorder, or obsessive compulsive disorder. So in the case of anorexia nervosa caused by pandas, that would be a child who, let's say, doesn't live in a weight-focused home or environment, a child who hasn't been preoccupied with body image before and just wakes up one day and suddenly will not eat because they don't want to get fat. They're using words that sound a lot like what we associate with anorexia nervosa, but they have anorexia nervosa that's caused by a strep infection. That infection has caused an autoimmune response that has damaged the child's brain. That is a 100% biology-based dysfunctional eating behavior 
that is not genetic at all, although there may be a genetic underpinning that makes that child susceptible and we don't know. Now, I wrote PANS here and not PANDAS because it seems that there are other infections besides streptococcal infection that can also cause this syndrome. So PAN stands for Pediatric Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Syndrome, and it doesn't specify that it's only related to strep infection. So there are some examples of solely biology-based dysfunctional eating behaviors, but there's lots more that may be partially biology-based or for the vast majority biology-based. That would include some other autoimmune diseases like diabetes, which you know could be type 1, could be type 2. We know there's so much um, overlap between um, dysfunctional eating behavior and type 1 diabetes that uh, the American Academy of uh, American Diabetes Academy recommends that all teenagers with type 1 diabetes be assessed for eating disorders. We know that in type 2 diabetes, often dysfunctional eating behaviors predate the development of diabetes type 2. And there's also MODI, maturity onset diabetes of youth. There's all kinds of connections between dysfunctional eating behaviors and the biology that then leads to diabetes. We don't have it all figured out, that's for sure. We also know that concussion can lead to dysfunctional eating behavior. It's easy to say, well, an athlete who has a concussion and isn't able to compete might, let's say, stop eating because now that they're not eating, oh, sorry, now that they're not competing, they don't want to eat because they think they'll gain weight. That's possible. That would be a behavioral connection. But there's also a biological connection. Concussion is an insult to the brain, right? A closed head injury. And so in some cases, an individual with a concussion will develop dysfunctional eating behaviors. And over time, as the brain heals, the dysfunctional eating behaviors tend to step away. In some cases, they don't. And they're permanent and need a different kind of treatment. But any kind of illness that alters brain function or even something that alters metabolism or body weight, we could add in here, we could add hypothyroidism, we could add hyperthyroidism, we could add in PCOS, we could add in all kinds of hormonal problems. Um, there's even been a connection between cancer and eating disorders. Um, when someone loses weight due to cancer and then is uh, concerned about gaining the weight back, I know that sounds a little bit controversial, but it absolutely happens. There's also the possibility that some innate personality traits can contribute to dysfunctional eating behavior, things like perfectionism. And we don't really know what all of these things are, but we do know that genes are biology and also genes interact with environment. So there is a gene susceptibility that is separate from environmental biologic interference, but we know there's at least one type of autoimmune eating disorder connection, so it's possible that there might be more. So this is a big type, type one, biology-based dysfunctional eating behavior, but there might be a lot more of um, that I haven't even listed here, but these are just some examples. And they may coexist. They may coexist with um, Anxiety, I would also add, I guess I'll add psychiatric issues here, anxiety, depression, OCD, those I would include as biology-based illnesses that can cause biology-based dysfunctional eating behaviors. The reason this is important, of course, is not just because now we can say it, okay, you have a biology-based dysfunctional eating behavior, but it's to say, and here is how we need to treat it. So clearly someone with hypo or hyperthyroidism needs to be treated, right? Someone with anxiety, depression, someone with PCOS, someone with OCD, someone with a concussion, someone with diabetes, someone with celiac disease, greater will of pain. Someone needs to be treated appropriately for the biological origin of their dysfunctional eating behavior. So the treatment is specific to the condition. So that could be, um, it could be medication in many cases. It could be, um, Therapy it could be cognitive behavioral therapy in some cases. It could be nutrition restoration, probably in most cases, and nutritional counseling in many cases. It could probably involve exposure and response prevention, depending on if it's sort of an anxiety-related biology-based dysfunctional eating behavior. And it might even include some brain treatments that haven't even been invented yet, things um, that maybe we don't think of as typical for eating disorder treatment, like transcranial magnetic stimulation, 
or um, who knows what else there is. Maybe it's meditation. There's so many things that can help with brain training, right, that may influence some of these. And then on top of that, there may be actual psychoactive medication or non-psychoactive medication, insulin, um, Android, something that actually treats the dysfunctional eating behavior. I even heard from my dermatologist about someone who developed an anorexia after having um, been diagnosed with eczema all over her body. And after the eczema was treated, she no longer had anorexia. I, I don't know the connection. I don't know how it all works. But I can tell you that um, there's definitely connections between biology and eating disorders. And we don't know what they all are, but if we don't accept that some of these things are interconnected, then we're only studying the biology of eating disorders without studying the biological impact of these other issues. Okay. I want to go on to type 2, which is our addiction-based dysfunctional eating behavior. And addiction certainly has some biological components and they definitely fall under here the let's say a subtype of um, biological based dysfunctional eating behaviors but I think that addictions have enough of their own individuality and symptomatology that they sort of warrant a second section here so addiction related and by addiction I include process addictions I include um, anything that could be either an addictive substance or an addictive behavior. Um, so I'll just use, uh, I'll use substance use disorder as sort of a catch-all term, but the substance could be gambling, the substance could be sex, the substance could be a behavior. So substance use disorder can lead to dysfunctional eating behavior, dysfunctional eating behavior can lead to substance use disorder, right? It's a chicken and an egg question, and it may not even be important which one started because usually they both have to be treated together. Otherwise, someone switches to the other one when they can't use whatever substance they're being treated for. Now, is food an addictive substance? I really don't know. I know that food is a mood-altering chemical, and we tend to sort of poo-poo that, I think, when we talk about food not being addictive. But just because I'm not addicted to a food, why would I say that someone else can't be addicted to food? I really don't know if you can. But if someone has been addicted to a substance and they describe their eating, their dysfunctional eating behaviors as feeling like an addiction, perhaps they could be treated with the same methodology that benefited them in their substance use addiction. So, for example, if they benefited from 12-step or if they benefited from having a sponsor or whatever they benefited from, that would be a skill that they could use to manage their dysfunctional eating behavior, possibly. Now, there's also the possibility that someone developed a substance use disorder coming from dysfunctional eating behavior, and so they don't have skills that they can use to manage that. They have actually turned to a substance, let's say it's um, a stimulant, or let's say it's oh, meth, um, heroin, cocaine, something that helps them not have an appetite, right? So they, they turn to uh, a substance in order to help them with their already dysfunctional eating behaviors or their distorted body image. And so in that case, we have to help someone with, obviously, education, nutritional counseling to help them no longer need the substance, but if they become addicted to the substance, either psychologically or physically, they're also going to need addiction treatment. So it's really important that we also add on eating disorder, dysfunctional eating treatment together with the substance use treatment. And that is something that I feel we are pretty lacking in our study of because a lot of people are eliminated from research if they have another addiction. Sometimes even if they're taking medicine, they're eliminated from research. So we have this whole population of individuals with both dysfunctional eating behavior and substance use behavior that we don't have information on because they mutually exclude each other um, in research population. Okay. Keep going. Hang with me. The next category is the stress and trauma based dysfunctional eating behavior. And I recently was following along, I think, on Twitter, on some kind of social media, this is the Nita Vita conference. And there was a, 
a presentation that studied people who had food insecurity as a, a precursor to their dysfunctional eating behaviors. That was so shocking to me because I feel like I've been talking about this for so long and nobody has been listening. So obviously someone else has the same idea too, and I'm so glad that they're doing research on it. Because in our, in my profession, which is dietetics, there seems to be a total misunderstanding that food insecurity leads to dysfunctional eating behaviors. And I feel like it's just such a big gap to try to treat food insecurity without looking at the dysfunctional eating behaviors that it causes or to try to treat dysfunctional eating behaviors without looking at childhood feeding experiences or food insecurity. And food insecurity isn't just a childhood experience, of course. It's also something that occurs all the time. It can occur for someone who is confined, who's in prison, someone who's homeless, someone who's just impoverished and lets their children have the food and they go hungry. So there are a lot of, of food insecurity related stresses and dysfunctional eating behaviors. And then there's also chronic stress, and there's also acute trauma. And all of these things, because they cause brain changes, and we know poverty is actually a risk factor for brain changes, that anything that causes a brain change can also cause an eating change. Um, an example that drove me crazy was when 9-11 um, happened, right? And on the news, I, I would see, you know, watch your children for any of these signs of, of stress or depression. Um, and it would say not sleeping and not wanting to go to school and crying. And never once did I see changes in eating behavior, which clearly is a response to stress. Now, some people, when they're stressed, they eat more. Some people, when they're stressed, they eat less. But many people have stress-related dysfunctional eating behaviors, and it's different. It's different than an addiction-related dysfunctional eating behavior, and it's different from a biology-based dysfunctional eating behavior. Now, there's obviously biology associated with trauma-based dysfunctional eating behavior, right? But if the trauma was related to food, then we end up with an overlapping situation where we have to treat the food trauma, we have to treat the trauma trauma, and we have to help someone kind of in this situation um, get an appropriate relationship with food while also healing the traumatic experience that they've had or healing the, the results of it. So this might look like PTSD. It may not look like PTSD. It may just look like someone who had a terrible experience and now has, uh, for whatever reason, doesn't want to eat. It could be someone who specifically had an eating-related bad experience. So we sometimes have kids who are afraid to throw up or afraid to swallow. It's sort of almost a conversion disorder. And it could be a bad experience that happened totally unrelated to food. So we even have community-wide traumas. Um, for us in Dallas, it was when five police officers were shot by a sniper. Um, in Houston, it might be having um, the terrible flood Hurricane Harvey brought. Um, there's lots of times and ways that, that we humans inappropriately or incompletely process trauma and that unprocessed trauma can change our eating behaviors. Again, why this is important is because someone needs treatment for the underlying issues as well as the nutrition counseling and, and possibly the psych meds and the counseling that they need to manage their, their eating. So if we put, let's say, someone who has this type of dysfunctional eating behavior, let's say we put them in the same group with someone who has type 1 diabetes or the same group with someone who has a substance-related dysfunctional eating behavior, they may not all be getting what they need because this person needs either rape crisis counseling or grief and loss counseling or EMDR or whatever they need for their underlying issues, right? And not just talk therapy and not just nutritional counseling and not just any one thing. They need this address. Now, again, as I mentioned, I believe that many to most clinicians, dietitians, therapists, psychiatrists, nurses, doctors who are really skilled at eating disorder treatment, I believe many to most already do this. We assess what it is that caused someone or led to someone dysfunctional eating behavior. Now, sometimes someone thinks it's something that it isn't. That's always possible, right? That someone says, oh, I developed my eating disorder when I didn't make the soccer team. 
when really they have mononucleosis and that caused an autoimmune reaction in their brain, which caused brain damage, which caused their eating disorder. So sometimes we have to be more of a detective because the person may not actually be able to verbalize what it is that caused their eating disorder. Um, it may have been so long ago that someone doesn't remember. Um, there's lots of reasons for us to do very, very thorough assessments that last much more than the first session. And so I do believe that this is what we're doing. But I believe that it is not what is being looked at when it comes to research. That research is focusing on the outcome behaviors and not the origins. And the problem with that is that they're different diseases. I do believe that what we call anorexia nervosa probably has several different subtypes. There's probably a, a terminal version of anorexia nervosa. This is the patient who it's not going to get better, and I, ugh, I just hate thinking about it, honestly, because it's depressing, because we have no treatment um, for this person who really is sort of using their eating disorder as a way to end their life. The person who will, you know, unplug their tube feeding, or if you give them a pick line for TPN, they'll contaminate it with feces. I mean, this is a person who doesn't want treatment. Um, there are people, of course, who have terminal anorexia who do want treatment, and that may be a different disease, right? That may be a, a different strain or strand or type of the disease, or it may be the same disease in a different type of person. We just don't know. But there's also types of anorexia nervosa that come from an um, autoimmune reaction. There's types of anorexia that may be innate or inborn. They may be related to puberty, which may mean that they're hormonal. We know that, that boys who have a female twin have a higher chance of developing eating anorexia than boys who have a male twin. So is it something, you know, estrogen or testosterone related? We really don't know, but these may be very different diseases that all look like anorexia. And so when we call them all anorexia nervosa, we end up clumping together people who actually have different diseases. Just like if we say all of these people are coughing, we need to quarantine all of them, we're not helping those people because someone might have seasonal allergies and they just need a Claritin. And someone else might be choking on a chicken bone and they need the Heimlich maneuver. To just say they're all coughing so that's the same disease is just absurd and yet we do it with people who have dysfunctional eating behavior. Let me go on now to the fourth category of dysfunctional eating behavior origins, which is learned behavior. Learned and environmental. So this encompasses those philosophies or frameworks of eating disorder development that look at um, the patriarchy as a trigger for dysfunctional eating behavior, or the media as a trigger for dysfunctional eating behavior, or a diet program, or someone who has grown up in a family with dysfunctional eating behaviors. Um, the sort of textbook example would be someone like a wrestler, who, you know, now the NCAA has very strict rules about your competition weight and your off-season weight, but let's say when I was in college or high school, there were no such rules, and so someone could try to make weight, right? by doing all kinds of dysfunctional eating behaviors in advance of their weigh-in. And then there were more dysfunctional eating behaviors that came in after the weigh-in. So that would be an example of dysfunctional eating behaviors that were learned or caused by environmental or what we might call peer pressure. Those individuals who are doing those dysfunctional eating behaviors may not actually have an eating disorder in the, in the sense of a biologically based eating disorder. They may just be doing behaviors that are caused by body dissatisfaction, or caused by cultural food practices, or caused by unrealistic, thin ideal standards, or caused by job requirements, or caused by athletic performance requirements. And so those would be things that would also include cleanses, and oh, I don't even want to think about paleo, and vegan, and vegan, and all of those different diets. That to me is learned behavior dysfunctional eating. And it is as insidious as any of the others. I don't want to suggest that, oh, we should treat people with these kinds of dysfunctional eating behaviors and not people with these. Absolutely not. But it's that the treatment would be different 
the treatment might not be medication for this person because they don't have a biological illness. The treatment might be, for example, media literacy, which we do teach in eating disorder treatment. It might be something like mindfulness. It might be intuitive eating. Um, intuitive eating is a great alternative to learned dysfunctional eating behavior. Intuitive eating won't help someone with pandas. And antibiotics that are needed for pandas won't help someone with learned dysfunctional eating behavior. So hopefully you're seeing where I'm going with this, which is that the origins of the dysfunctional eating behavior are essential in order to identify what it is that we need to do to treat this individual. We can't put all of these people in the same group with all of these other people and expect them all to benefit from the same treatment, and that's what we're currently doing. I haven't even mentioned family therapy or family-based therapy, which I think family-based therapy is probably very helpful for people with biology-based eating disorders because they literally need um, the support of refeeding, right? which doesn't have to happen in family-based therapy, but which is the crux of family-based therapy. But someone who has a stress and trauma-related dysfunctional eating behavior, especially if the stress and trauma is caused by the family, is not going to have beneficial effects from family-based therapy, right? So that's where our research gets really mixed up, and we have these numbers that are really quite terrible for family-based therapy that say, you know, 30% of people improve with, with family-based therapy, but yet there's people who 100% benefited from it. So how do you explain that? Well, it's because they may not have had the same disease, and so the same treatment is not going to help them. So someone who gets that, let's say, self-esteem work and anti-bullying education and, you know, learns about, oh, how everything is photoshopped and learns about how it's important to love yourself before you can expect validation or instead of expecting validation from other people. This is a lot of what we talk about in sort of body image work and um, in sort of eating disorder remediation. But for someone who really doesn't have a problem with their body, let's say, and, you know, has, let's say, one of these other types of dysfunctional eating behaviors, they may not even want to participate in that, right? We've all seen that where there's that one person who, you know, I don't know, maybe they're just so depressed that they don't even care about being alive. And so really, they would just kind of sneer at the idea that they're trying to be like a celebrity in Hollywood, but please, that is the last thing on their mind. And so we end up treating people inappropriately by assuming that their behaviors point to the same disorder. So I've said the same thing in a bunch of different ways. I hope it's made sense. I'm happy to answer any questions. And what I really dream of is that we can move forward as a field and start to look at categorizing eating disorders or dysfunctional eating behaviors as biology-based, addiction-based, stress and trauma-based, learned environment-based, or even just biology-related, addiction-related. If, if we don't want to go so far as to say it's based in that, then at least related. And that way, each person can get better treatment for what it is that they need. I do think a lot of us are doing this work, and it's very, very important, but I think in order for it to move forward and for us to get better treatment protocols to treat people as individuals, we have to be able to look at the origins of their dysfunctional eating behaviors and not just the outcome. And I'll just add one more thing, which is that the very worst thing we can do to categorize eating disorders is to use weight or, God forbid, BMI, and the DSM is riddled with that. And so it would be really great if our insurance world, if our treatment world, if our diagnostic criteria were completely weight neutral because dysfunctional eating behaviors do not discriminate and they especially don't discriminate based on weight. So that covers everything I wanted to say. What are your questions for me? I can't hear you. Jacqueline, I see your mouth moving, but I can't hear you. I apologize. Oh. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so one question that was posed by our audience is, what are your thoughts about educating parents um, on media literacy, particularly in regard to the social media well, phenomena? <laughs> okay, so I haven't even mentioned social media, but clearly that would fall in this category. And I think that you know, social media is 
is just a, what do you call that? Uh, like a bubble? That's not quite the right word. A microcosm? Yeah, everything that already exists in the world, right? Like bullying, like um, photoshopping, like bragging, like being left <laughs> out. You know, all of those things that exist in the world, they're just exacerbated by social media. That feeling of everybody's doing something fun and I'm being left out. Or everybody's on this diet and I'm not. Or everybody had the most fantastic chef prepared dinner last night and I had a soggy tuna sandwich. I really think if people would post more pictures of their soggy tuna sandwiches, we'd all be such happier people, right? But, so, you know, as far as advice to parents, I think it's, it's that, you know, we just need to be involved. We need to know what's going on. You know, the same way I would want to, let's say, look at a magazine with my child and, and sort of identify, oh, well, you know, that's a body type. And actually, I don't even think it's real because, look, you can see right there where, you know, this person's leg is like three times longer than their torso. That's impossible. So clearly this was modified by Photoshop. You know, just, just in everyday conversation, not talking about people's bodies in inappropriate ways, not talking about people in bullying ways, but but sort of being that role model for body acceptance and, and acceptance of other people, hopefully what we are doing then is when someone, you know, one of our kids sees something, they have a little bit of discernment in order to know that either it's not real or that, you know, just because everybody's at a party doesn't actually mean that nobody likes me, you know, that kind of thing. I, I'm definitely not a child um, social media expert. I would point to someone like a Kathy Cater, um, who I think, you know, is really excellent work on helping kids navigate this kind of stuff. Um, but big picture, I think, is just a matter of being involved more than anything. Excellent. And another question was regarding intuitive eating. What do you consider the best sources for clinicians to share with their clients for training and educating themselves about that? Well, intuitive eating, I think, just came out in a third edition or is about to, and intuitive eating, the workbook, just came out. So I would just go straight to the source. That is so exciting to know. Very cool. Alrighty, so you have provided an exceptional presentation. Thank you so much. I know everyone is just fascinated by this. Um, at, at just for a wrap up, could you share with us a little bit about your eating disorder boot camps or any other ways that our colleagues can consult or work with you, Jessica? Sure. So supervision of other professionals has become my main job. I love it. Boot camp is sort of a day and a half of supervision, but I also do coaching or supervision or whatever you want to call it, case consultation, by phone and by video chat. So um, understandingnutrition.com is my website where you can see any upcoming eating disorder boot camp. You can sign up for a package of consulting sessions. You're always welcome to contact me directly at info at understandingnutrition.com and check out anything with me. Um, if you're a dietitian, join IFED. It's only $25. It'll be the best $25 you've ever spent. You'll get to join the listserv, and you'll be in our treatment finder. Um, and really, I love to come out to hospitals, military bases, treatment centers, and do training. So there's lots of opportunities for us to work together, um, whether it's long distance or in person. So I'd encourage you just to get in touch. Yeah, I'd encourage you to work with Jessica. She is Phenomenal. What a gift you are to our field. We're really uh, grateful that you presented for us today. Thank you very much, Jessica. Yeah, my pleasure. And I really appreciate the platform because, you know, talking about this, I feel like it, it doesn't have to be controversial, but for whatever reason it is. And so I've just learned, um, I guess, it's sort of a Brene Brownism, you know, to, to not shy away from controversy. That's how we're going to get things done. So even if someone disagrees with me, I would welcome hearing your thoughts about it, or if you have any suggestions of how to improve the model, I'm open to it. Let's talk. Perfect. Thank you. Happy, uh, happy New Year to you, Jessica. If I don't talk to you before, take care. Bye. Thanks, Jacqueline.